This episode has been brought to you by Flowstate, the unlimited web flow development service. Find out more at flowstate.dev. Hello and welcome to another episode of Webflow and Code where I teach you the underlying code you're writing in Webflow. So here today marks another video where I share with you my experiences over streaming the last few weeks discovering new no code tools and just trying to better my understanding and better me as a coder, developer, whatever you want to call it. So I took a look at Wix Studio and I was so excited for Wix Studio. Really it is aimed itself at agencies and enterprises so it presents itself as a much more advanced tool and you know me I love advanced tools I love having that control so I spent two hours just streaming trying to fumble my way around it and here's three reasons why I think it's a great no-code tool Wix uses its own JavaScript like language called Velo that not only runs on the front end that does the normal JavaScript things that you would expect but also you can write back-end logic too this means you can build APIs using Velo and then access those APIs from the front end. So you can write a function that goes into the CMS, gets a collection of people, but only gets their first name as an example. So when you hit that API that all runs on the server, you just get a list of first names and you can do whatever you want with those things. And the one aspect of that, that which is great, is because you're writing public APIs that your front end can consume, you can then build a mobile app that then reaches for that same CMS so you can really expand your application. It's all handled in the same system. And not only that, you can also install NPM modules, which just make it vastly more versatile in terms of like, you know, downloading GSAP or backend languages like Lodash. You can build your own packages as well. So, and then distribute those or share those in the marketplace. What's also pretty awesome is that not only can you write code and edit your code, uh, syncing with VS Code, but you can also sync your code with GitHub, so you have an external copy of it, or you can work it, work with it in your own way. This whole code development system is really, really powerful, and it's hidden. Uh, well, not hidden, but you click to activate it, which is something I really would love to see in Webflow, where if you've got the balls to do so, you flip that switch, you can enter a sort of development mode where you get extra versatility and extra access to your website. The other aspect which I didn't really, I'll be honest, I didn't really dig into, nor is it something I really explore too much of just because it's not in my day to day, but the platform itself can extend very, very far. It's got e-commerce, it's got blogging, it's got marketing, automations, it's got a CRM even. And it's all built into that system. So when I think about Wix Studio, and a client coming to me and wanting a tool, that level of confidence knowing that it can do an awful lot is really, really reassuring and not having those reservations about this ceiling that I talk about. I have utmost confidence that it can handle any marketing website or pretty much any website that you can throw at it, honestly. Like, it's limitless in terms of its functionality. There's a caveat to that, which I'll get to at the end though. Now this third one is a really strange one because it's both a benefit and you know something that, that confuses me. It uses this thing called docking, which from a technical perspective, it's just percentage-based margins and padding. You drag things onto the canvas and you can just fluidly move them around and say, oh, I want it there, I want it there, I want it there. It feels like you're just absolutely positioning stuff, but it's not. It's all relatively positioned, but it's using percentages on everything. And in the style editor, you type things and you work with pixels. But when it renders on the website, it's all percentages. And the result of that is, as you scale or move your browser. Everything is just fluid and scales proportionately and it's responsive. It just handles it like magic. Going into the downsides or the, the things I think they can improve is this the same aspect. It's this docking or percentage-based mechanism. It's a completely different way of looking or, or designing websites. And I had to basically just disregard any preconceptions I had about designing a website. I was looking for things like Flexbox, like Grid, or I was struggling on the stream to basically zero out the height so it just adjusts to the height of the content. So I had a, I had a repeater and obviously different varying sizes of texts. And I just wanted it just to collapse and then whatever the length of that text is, it just grows, 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 grows. 
to fix that, I had to get my mouse and drag up the bottom, just zero out that height. That for me would have been a technical, I would have put in sort of um, zero minimum height as an example of that thing. They don't even let you drag things around in the navigator. You have to do it in the designer. They just need to justify their approach and say, designers are so used to using stacks and flex boxes, but we want them to have the freedom and flexibility to design as they want without relying on the style panel because that's, that's essentially what it is. It, I was relying on the style panel, but I need to rely more on the designer and just getting moving things in a way that I would use Photoshop in a traditional way or Figma instead of using the style panel. I sort of rolled two into one there. I think it's the education and communication around the tool could be a lot better. It really is the designer. It's technical, but it's so hard to describe. Like, so as an example, for instance, right, I wanted something to be Flexbox. I was looking in the style panel for ages for Flex, and there's Flex boxes in the assets panels. It wasn't doing what I wanted to. I had to select three items, right click, stack is in there. That's a styling situation. So why is that not in the style panel? So the design interface specifically in the style interface is very unintuitive. Wit, uh, a Twitter friend of mine, shared the exact same opinion where loves the code aspect, sees the potential in the tool, but was so turned off by the unintuitive um, styling and user interface that they just gave up on it. And I think this is a real downside. Again, this is, there's this idea that it's an enterprise tool. I'm sorry, but an enterprise tool doesn't need to overcomplicate things. You don't need to justify its enterprise nature by making the tool more complex. Make it simple, Wix. Make it easy for people to move from Figma or Webflow or any other no-code tool, or at least marry up what you're doing with docking into those preconceptions. So anyway, we'll wrap it up there. I actually do want to continue with uh, Wix. I do think there's a misunderstanding that's happening somewhere. Like I say, when I discovered the stacking in the right-hand contextual menu, that opened up a whole world of, of being able to design effectively in Wix. So I do want to persist with it. It's lovely having everything. Maybe it's an OCD thing, I don't know, but it's lovely just having everything there. So I'm, I'm, I'm persistent. I'm going to be persistent with Wix, but for now, we'll leave it at that one. Join me on my next stream, actually. I try and do them every Sunday. I'm not sure when this video is going out, but I'm likely going to be doing the stream. I want to look at um, WeWeb. I want to look at Web Studio, I think it's called. And during one of these streams as well, I want to look into DevLink and fixing up into a Next.js project. So I have, a, I have a backlog of these streams that I want to do, and I love doing them. It's great chatting to you guys. Like, subscribe if you haven't already, and until next time, happy no coding. <laughs>